I don't think. Welcome everyone yeah. to one of our last presentations today. Marco Brill, it, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much and thank you for this uh, introduction. Um, I would like to give a talk on target language use by L2 teachers during COVID-19 online and offline education, um, which means that I would like to focus on the use of, uh, of the L2 by non-native uh, teachers. Uh, and I, uh, I compared the, the amount of target language use um, um, in an online and offline education setting, uh, because in the Netherlands, um, and I, I think in Japan is, it's the same story, um, that all uh, schools were closed and there was a homeschooling situation, which means that uh, the target language needs to be adapted to a, uh, an online setting. So um, the question is, does the amount of uh, target language use by L2 teacher changed over time when you compared, uh, for example, in a period pre-COVID-19, uh, during COVID-19, when all uh, schools were closed and there was an uh, online uh, education setting, and then when uh, schools were open again in an offline education setting, as, uh, does the target language use changed uh, in this period? So we all know that uh, the input is essential for L2 development. Uh, for example, uh, stated by the input hypothesis by Krashen, uh, which means that when there is input, uh, all levels of L2 development, so all linguistic competences are promoted. Um, however, there is, a, uh, there is a important characteristic of the input, um, which is comprehensible. So the input needs to be comprehensible, which is known as the comprehensible input uh, by Krashen, uh, which means that uh, it needs to follow a I plus one principle. So the idea is to uh, provide input at a level just above the, the proficiency level of the uh, L2 uh, learner. So it's up to the teacher and the educational material to adapt this language um, proficiency. Uh, on the other hand, there uh, is a uh, rich occasion for output when there is input. So when there is a lot of input, there needs to be output uh, from the L2 learner. So th this means that there is interaction and there are a lot of uh, occasions to receive, for example, uh, feedback, negative feedback or positive feedback. So it, it's just a, sort of a circle. And when there is a circle of interaction, L2 development is promoted. So input is absolutely essential for L2 development. Um, on the other hand, input stimulates student motivation as well. So it's not only focused on the linguistic competence, but also on student motivation and classroom climate, uh, which has been shown, for example, in a review study by Hall and Cook in 2012, uh, who showed that um, when there is a lot of input in the classroom, students are motivated to, to speak, uh, to read, and to, to handle the, uh, the L2 and foreign language. But the use of the L1 can, can also support foreign language acquisition. So um, choosing a 100% input uh, environment is not enough. So you need to, 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 to search for um, a middle between the L1 and the L2 in the classroom. Um, for example, by translanguaging. So translanguaging means that you use the L1 uh, in a context of L2 learning, for example, by, by uh, translating, or for example, translating instructions uh, in the L1 and to compare to the L2. So you need to, to handle both uh, modalities. So as we all have known, uh, when you compare, for example, several teachers of a feral language, uh, there is a lot of variety. There is a lot of variation in the use of, uh, of target language. There are student, uh, teachers who use a lot of target language in classroom, uh, while there are a lot of teachers as well who don't very use uh, a lot of uh, foreign language in, in the classroom. So what are exactly uh, the, the determiners of the amount of target language used by non-native foreign language teachers? So that's what we know um, based on previous uh, studies. Um, for example, the personal factors. Uh, the personal factors means that the pedagogical skills of the uh, teachers are very important to promote um, the amount of target language used in the classroom. On the other hand, it's the language proficiency um, of both the teacher and, um, 
an NEL2 learner and our experience as a foreign language learner as well. So when the teacher is a very experienced learner of a foreign language, um, he or she um, can use the uh, target language um, in a broader sense than uh, learners who are not, not very experienced in learning foreign languages. Uh, secondly, there are factors related to the teaching practice, uh, which means that when there is an incomprehension or comprehension among learners, uh, teachers uh, might need to choose another level following the I plus one principle by uh, Gresham uh, to adapt the target language use. So when there is a lot of incomprehension, they might, for example, adapt their language proficiency um, from a target language perspective. Um, so it's, it's absolutely um, a challenge to integrate, for example, target language use in, uh, in, in language learners with a very low uh, language proficiency. Um, so the learner's proficiency and the attitudes are very important as well for a determination of target language use. And there is a subject complexity factor, which means that when the subject is complex, for example, the instruction of grammar with respect to instruction in, in, in speaking uh, education, um, the selection of the target language um, is uh, complicated when there is, for example, grammar instruction. So the subject complexity determines the, uh, the amount of target language used in the classroom. And thirdly, there are a lot of external factors. For example, target language used by colleagues, uh, when there are uh, teachers who use uh, a lot of target language by their colleagues, they're extremely motivated to use the target language in the classroom as well. Uh, but also school policy, uh, educational materials, um, and the social status of the foreign language um, uh, in, in, in the country. Uh, so when English, for example, is a language with a high social uh, status in the country, English teachers, or I, I need to say teachers um, in English as a second language or foreign language, um, they might choose their language easily, more easily than, for example, teachers of another language. However, until now, to the best of my knowledge, there's no research on potential effects of educational setting. Um, is there a difference, for example, between offline and online education when you focus on the amount of target language used by non-native um, foreign language teachers? So our research question were, does the educational setting, which means offline or online, affect the amount of target language used by non-native foreign language teachers while controlling for teachers' experience, language proficiency and pedagogical skills? the student's language proficiency and target language use uh, with colleagues. So um, research question two is if it is, if there are differences between these two uh, educational settings, in which linguistic competences did these differences in target language use in instruction between offline and online education can be observed? Are there, for example, differences between instructions in speaking education with respect to uh, listening education. And thirdly, does teacher populations, which means English versus French as a foreign language, affect the amount of target language? Where, um, when taken in, into account, for example, the social status of the uh, foreign language. So what is exactly the design of this study? The focus was, so potential effects of educational setting, on TLU by non-native teachers. So I only select non-native teachers, so English and French uh, was the L2 of this particular uh, population of teachers. We measured with respect to the target language amount on offline pre-COVID-19 education, um, during online COVID-19 homeschooling, and again, offline post COVID-19 homeschooling when uh, schools were open again. So we had three times uh, of measurements uh, and we asked teachers to evaluate their amount of um, target language use in the classroom, offline or online. And the third measurement aimed to measure potential differences between online and post COVID-19 homeschooling in order to compare it with the pre-COVID-19 education setting. So maybe there are differences between 
pre-COVID and post homeschooling situations, um, which might be, uh, for example, influenced by the online setting. So um, we focused on the amount of target language use, uh, which has been determined in terms of, of scores um, during instruction in foreign language speaking, um, reading, writing, listening, and grammar education. And we controlled for uh, a particular set of personal uh, teaching and external factors. So the statistical design here is a mixed and over per language competence with a between subject variable uh, teachers of English versus French. In the Netherlands, uh, English is a language with the highest social status with compared to French. Um, within subject variable is the time of measurement with three levels, pre, uh, during COVID-19 homeschooling and offline, post COVID-19 homeschooling, and a particular set of co-variables. And we included years of experience of the teacher, proficiency, uh, so it's the teacher's proficiency in foreign language, uh, student's proficiency in foreign language, pedagogical, pedagogical skills, and target language use with colleagues. Um, so with respect to the method, so we, uh, we asked uh, to 60 non-native teachers in Dutch secondary education, uh, of which were 37 uh, teachers of French and 23 teachers of English, uh, with an experience range between one year and 30 year, which is a large range, uh, but it's very important to include it as a covariate in, in our design because there's a lot of variation. Um, and same holds for target language proficiency range, which range between B1 and C2 level of uh, proficiency. Um, so with respect to the materials, we um, um, uh, administered a online questionnaire on a 10 point Likert scale, which was based on a self report. Uh, here you can see an example of one uh, question. Uh, on the left one side, you see, for example, target language use during grammar instruction in offline pre-COVID-19 education. So during the first lockdown in the Netherlands, we asked uh, this group of teachers to evaluate to what extent they use their use of uh, target language use with respect to, for example, grammar instruction in a period before COVID-19. Uh, so it's on a, on a 10 point Likert scale that they have to evaluate their, their amount of a target language. Um, we ask it again during uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, homeschooling when their situation is completely online. And then we ask it again when schools are open again and the classrooms were open so that it was an offline uh, education setting. So, and we ask this for all linguistic competences, uh, for linguistic competence and grammar instruction, and we control for a particular set of covariates. So, for example, for the pedagogical skills, we uh, ask them to, um, to fill in a perception of knowledge and um, sorry, skills in teaching tests uh, by Choi and colleagues, which was validated by uh, these colleagues. Uh, and this that measures the self-perceived pedagogical skills and knowledge of teachers. Uh, so there's an, a score of this uh, test, which was integrated in the analysis. With respect to dealing with colleagues, uh, there was one question in the questionnaire uh, on which they need to indicate the amount of minutes per week during which the target language was used among colleagues. So it was an evaluation, self-reported evaluation. And the same holds for teachers and students' proficiency. So for example, um, there was a question about the self-perceived report by teachers. Uh, so they need to evaluate their own proficiency. What, what do they think? Uh, and what was the proficiency of the target group? So for example, when there uh, was a group of beginning learners, they need to uh, evaluate their proficiency. So um, all was based on a on self-perceived report. And here are the results. So on the left-hand side, you can see the amount of target language use um, uh, on the basis of all grammatical uh, or, or, or linguistic uh, competences. And what you can see um, below, for example, you can see grammar before, which means uh, what the amount of target language use is in a uh, instruction setting where grammar is the focus uh, before COVID-19, 
during, which means online homeschooling, and after means after homeschooling uh, and all schools were open and there was an offline vacation setting. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see the difference between French and English uh, teachers. Uh, so for now, you can see a lot of variation. So there are, a lot of, uh, there are large error bars, for example. Uh, so which means that the target language use is quite, uh, quite diverse in, in, in our populations. But there are very interesting um, research from uh, the statistical analysis. For example, with respect to grammar, there was no main effect of time of measurement, which means that overall, there was no difference between uh, target language use or the amount of target language use in the period before, during, and after COVID-19 homeschooling. However, uh, and then I come back to, um, to, the, to the linguistic competences when there are covariates uh, here, uh, there was no interaction with teacher population as well, so either. So the teacher population means that it doesn't matter where, whether there is uh, a teacher of French or English with respect to potential effects of time of measurement. So there's no interaction with this logic here because there's no main effect of time of measurement. There are no interaction with covariates either. So uh, with respect to grammar instruction, target languages, target languages is not influenced by our set of covariates. However, teachers of English overall use more target language than teachers of French. With respect to the linguistic competences, for example, writing instruction, we didn't find a main effect of time of measurement either. No interaction with teacher populations. However, when you take into account the years of experience here, there is an effect of time of measurement. And that's very interesting. So overall, there's no time uh, of measurement effect. But when you control for years of experience, which means that the, the, the years of experience uh, of the particular um, uh, teacher influences the effect of, um, of the amount of target language used during, after, or pre-COVID-19 homeschooling. Um, and with respect to the uh, Paris comparisons, we found that online, uh, in online settings, there is less target language use. There's no difference, however, between pre and post online education, which means that teachers can use the same amount of target language in the post online education with respect to the pre online uh, education. However, there is a slow slowdown in online uh, target language use. And again, teachers of English use more target language than teachers of French. Uh, with respect to reading competence, there is no main effect overall of time of measurements, no interaction with teacher population. However, again, there is here a close to significant effect of time of measurements if controlled for years of experience, um, which means that there might be an effect, but it doesn't show up in our, uh, unfortunately, in our study. Um, but when you focus on the um, uh, on the previous comparisons, you can see that online situations uh, leads to less target language use, and there's no difference between pre and post online education. And here again, teachers of English use more target language than teachers of French. With respect is, uh, to speaking, we see the same uh, pattern in the results. No main effect of time of measurements, no interaction with teacher populations. However, um, when you control for target language use with colleagues, so the amount of target language used among colleagues, um, there is a time uh, of measurement effect, which means that there is less target language in an online setting with respect to an offline setting. Um, and that the, the amount of target language used among colleagues um, determines differences between offline and online uh, education. And here again, teachers of English use more target language than teachers of French. And then the last uh, linguistic competence is listening. And here we see exactly the same pattern in, um, in the results. So there is no main effect of time of measurements, no interaction with teacher population. However, there is an effect of time of measurements if, uh, if we controlled for years of experience. So, so it seems to be that the years of experience is a very important factor to determine 
the amount of target language in online and offline education. Um, and here again, in the online setting, there is less target language use. And when you compare it between pre and post, post online education, there's no difference. However, there's no difference here in target language use between teachers of English and French, interestingly. Maybe it might be there because of the p-value, which is uh, near to the significance level, but um, in this study, it doesn't show up. So with respect to the conclusions for now, um, I think we can conclude that foreign language teachers uh, use less target language in an online educational setting than in an offline educational setting, but not in grammar instruction. Um, and that might be related to the subject complexity as we saw in a theoretical framework. Um, if controlled, that's very important for personal practice related or external factors. So overall, there's no difference between online and offline, but when you take into account personal practice related or external factors, there is a difference between online and uh, offline educational setting. So this effect of educational setting is mediated by years of experience. When you focus, for example, on instructions, target language use in instruction, in writing and listening, and maybe in reading, it doesn't show up in our study, but it was close to significant. And target language with respect to colleagues, among colleagues, um, has been found in instruction in speaking education. So that in my opinion, might be very interesting for uh, educational practice, uh, practice, for example, uh, and also for teacher students uh, to uh, focus on, on one hand, target language use among colleagues, because that might promote also the, 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 uh, the target language use in offline, online settings. And on the other hand, it's, it's a years of experience factor that, that plays, uh, plays a role here. Um, with respect to the other covariates, there are no significant correlations. So that might be, an, might be a very interesting insight. Uh, and overall, teachers of English as a uh, foreign language use more target language during instruction than teachers of French as a foreign language, but not during, during instruction in listening education, which might be related um, in, the, in the Dutch context uh, to the social status of uh, the foreign language. English versus French. I would like to thank you for your attention and thank you for questions or suggestions or remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. That was very interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we um, I was just looking at the results there, and if I may, oh, sorry. I want to steal steal the um, the um, conversation here. But I don't have official uh, evidence from my classes. But here in J I'm in Japan, by the way, and my university classes students have told me that they find um, using the target language, which is English, is more prevalent uh, with online courses than in the classroom. And I think okay. it has something to do with them being intimidated when, when the foreign language teacher is up in front of them. They felt more comfortable in smaller breakout rooms on like a Zoom platform and speaking. Have you, did you get any of experience with that, with your research? That is, that, that's a very, very interesting remark. Um, so it might be related, for example, to, to for example, speaking anxiety. When you see, for example, for a language teacher, it might be, yeah, that's a very good point. I, for future research, we can, for example, include um, a variable called, for example, speaking anxiety uh, to look at potential differences or influences uh, with respect to anxiety. So that's a very good point. In the Netherlands, it, it's not very, in my opinion, it's not very, a, a, the same story because in online settings, the target language is also used. For example, uh, when, when I teach, for example, in French, I use a French language in the classroom, offline, and also online. So in, in Netherlands, it, it's, it's the same. Uh, um, we did not very uh, much change the target language uh, between offline and online settings. But that's a very interesting remark when your experience from Japan, for example, 
might be related to, to an anxiety factor in the classroom. So thank you. Yeah, no, I agree that 100% because I, when I, I was actually in the Netherlands in 1985, and yeah. I don't speak anything but English, really. And I was amazed at the the ability of, I won't, I won't say everyone, but everyone I came across in the Netherlands. I was in, I was in uh, Denmark too, and everyone spoke English. On a certain, I'm yeah. talking taxi drivers. I'm talking. Uh, train station uh, employees, pretty much everyone I came across spoke English on a certain level. And we don't experience that here in Japan. So obviously there are some, some societal implications happening. Uh, I, yeah. I think you'd be crazy to deny that, but I just thought that was really interesting because my students really wanted to stay in the online environment and, and communicate more. Um, I guess they felt more comfortable that way. That's very good. Thank you, though, for that. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, in a previous study, we also looked at language exposure in the society. Uh, for example, language exposure in English uh, in the Netherlands is, it is absolutely common. Uh, from primary school, English is, is, is a target language. So mm. the, the Dutch is, 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 the, is the environmental, environmental, sorry, environmental language, but English uh, is also in, integrated in the curriculum. So that's very um, important uh, because there's a lot of exposure. And we found, for example, in, in L3 learning that the amount of target language um, exposure also influences the proficiency. So we found a strong correlation between exposure and proficiency. So that, that, that might be related as well to, um, to the results, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, and again, I think that that's, that's a social status factor, uh, in my opinion. In so, the Netherlands, so status so of the foreign language. You start in the first grade then with uh, elementary school first grade of language with English. Yeah. Yeah. See that that is another huge thing. I am a young learner specialist, and I I've, I've been telling the government here we need. They start in the third grade now. And I'm mm -hmm. saying we need to move this to the first grade. And like you said, the exposure is so critical at that, that early yep. age. Uh, I'm actually an administrator for an uh, international school where we start them in kindergarten. And our students are so much better than the average uh, student in the Japanese school system. And it's, it's not maybe because of the teachers. Rather, I think it's because is it the exposure at a, at a critical stage of development when students aren't you know, uh, apprehensive about making mistakes. They're not apprehensive about um, using a foreign language. And I think that's that's a critical point. Again, thank you very much. It does look like we are out, out of time. Um, and so we would like to welcome you back to the, um, to the main session mm -hmm. where we will um, take a slight break, a five minute break and then uh, go into our online social. Maruka? Thank you very much. You too, thank you. That was really, sorry, and can I just ask one quick question? Um, so as Grant said, I, I'm in Japan too, and the Japanese government, like those like educational government, um, I think it has been like five years, five or six years now, but like they are trying to push um, the instructors of junior high school and um, elementary school teachers to use English as a major um, instruction language. Mm -hmm. so, so to increase the exposure and but it has been, I, I haven't seen any result yet. Maybe it's too soon to see the changes, but is there any like any kind of those like a national wide strategy are implemented in the Netherlands? Uh, yeah, so you mean from primary school? Yeah, uh, like yeah, yeah. switching those the there teachers the language. In the Netherlands, there are studies about this because, uh, as I said, English is integrated from primary school. Mm. Um, and for example, with uh, four or, or five years old students, so they're very young. Um, and we know from uh, recent studies that it, it, it is a very um, a positive 
from a lexical point of view. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the acquisition of vocabulary, for example, that's very in uh, interesting and that might, uh, might be increasing when exposure uh, commences at a very young age. Uh, however, when you compare, for example, students who were at a uh, primary school where the uh, English was not in integrated in the curriculum, and you compare it, for example, in secondary education, we can see uh, differences between proficiency in both groups. So when you see, for example, a group of um, primary school students who uh, were exposed to English uh, from a young age, mm. you can see that their proficiency level, of course, is, is higher than students who were not integrated in a, let's say, bilingual um, mm -hmm. uh, primary school. But this effect uh, disappears over time. So when you focus, for example, on a group of learners who were uh, uh, 15 or 16 years old, um, you did not, did not see any, any difference anymore. So uh, that's very interesting, but the main difference is focused on the lexical component and mm -hmm. not from grammar or grammatical thing, but it's, 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 it's the size of the vocabulary, which, um, which is positively influenced. And, uh, but over oh. time, it, it, might, it might disappear a little bit, but I think it it's, might be related to the, um, to the amount of exposure as well. Mm -hmm. So when there are, for example, one or two hours of exposure in the classroom at a primary school, it, it's not very enough to, 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 to promote, for example, uh, a bilingual situation where mm -hmm. the situation might be, uh, for example, 50% of English and 50% of the, of the home language. So I, I think that's, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of, um, of exposure in this case. But the, there are results about this in, in the Netherlands. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very interesting. Yes, let's go back to the main session. Then. Oh, okay, okay. We have to start the closing ceremony. Thank you. Very okay, much. thank you. Okay, you too. Thank you.